Well, good morning. It is good to see everyone. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, as we continue our overview of Ephesians chapter 1, and we look at how this whole passage fits together and how Paul develops the entire book really from the content and material that we see here in chapter 1. So far, if you look at your outline, what you're going to notice is we have gone through the entire outline. However, Paul likes to add thoughts to thoughts and sort of make subpoints upon subpoints. So really that final point is what we're going to spend our time on this morning. And there's a lot of material that Paul covers even in there. Uh, we're going to just look at that final stuff to cap off our view of Ephesians 1 and our understanding of it. So here's what we've been through. We looked at the introduction to blessings. Remember, the book of Ephesians is about how we are blessed in our position in Christ. And Paul introduces this whole concept, uh, or at least he introduces the letter in verses 1 through 2 that would lead into these blessings. And then in verse 3, he begins talking about the blessings themselves. He says that we are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. This isn't material blessings he's talking about. But these are no less real than the physical world. They are actually the things that will last beyond the world that we live in now. So these spiritual blessings are ours right now because we are in Christ Jesus. And so he develops those blessings in verses 3 through 14. We see he talks about the, ones, uh, the blessings that come from the Father, the blessings we receive through the Son, and then the blessings or blessing in verses 13 through 14 that we receive by the Holy Spirit. And then as he gets into verse 15, he now responds to all this. Okay, God's done all this for us, and he's done this in the life of the Ephesians. So Paul rejoices, he's thankful for this, and he enters into this prayer. And that's what we've been looking at most recently. He begins with a prayer of thanksgiving, and then he enters into this prayer of petition in verse 17. And he prays for three basic things that the Ephesians would have knowledge about God's calling for them to serve, that they would have knowledge about God's inheritance. That is, that we as believers in Jesus Christ are a possession, a treasured possession of God. We belong to him. And then finally, and this is what's going to end off this entire chapter, uh, beginning in really verse 19, he prays that we would have knowledge about God's power. And how God has displayed his power in that he exalted Christ and that he has empowered Christ. So we see that he has exalted Christ in verses 19 through 21 by raising him from the dead. What could be more exalting than victory over death? Taking something that is impossible, a feat that no human could ever accomplish, and easily overpowering it. And Jesus Christ is alive today, as real as we are right here Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father alive because he overpowered death. And then along with that, as I've already mentioned, Jesus Christ has been exalted by being seated. And this is actually a very specific technical term that's being used here uh, when Paul says in verse 20, he seated him at his right hand. Seating refers to enthronement. We see this used even in the Old Testament from which Paul is actually referencing. So this idea of seating a king on their throne is used frequently, but he's actually quoting directly or referencing directly Psalm 110, verse 1, a psalm about the coming Messiah. Now, Christ already came, so we're looking at this from the other side with still things in that psalm to be fulfilled. So that psalm is in process right now for us, but when it was given to Israel... They were looking at all of it as a future reality. They didn't know who Jesus was. They knew a Messiah was coming, but they didn't know him by name. We look back at that part of it. It says in Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Sit. This is a technical term referring to being enthroned. Be enthroned at my right hand is what God is saying. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The right-hand position, as we saw last time, and I mentioned when we went over this the first time in more detail, the right-hand position is a position in a kingdom 
where the closest advisor or the most personal, um, just the person that they would have the closest relationship to as a king would sit at that place. And Solomon, when he took the throne after his father David, he, he built this throne and he built a throne for his mother Bathsheba. And he gave that place, the second place in the entire kingdom, to his mother Bathsheba. And so we saw this situation in which his half-brother Adonijah, who tried to steal the kingdom away from him before he was enthroned, uh, after Solomon uh, quickly got rid of that problem, he didn't kill Adonijah at that point, but he made sure that he was the one that was anointed and put on the throne. Adonijah approached Bathsheba and asked her to do him a favor, to ask the king, ask his half-brother Solomon, to grant him one of David's harem. And so in that context, we saw in 1 Kings 2, verse 19 through 20, it says, So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king arose to meet her, bowed before her, and sat on his throne. Then he had a throne set for the king's mother, and she sat on his right. Then she said, I'm making one small request of you. Do not refuse me. And here's the key. What's a right-hand position? Why is it so important that somebody would be placed at a king's right hand in this close, close proximity to the most powerful person in the kingdom? He says, and the king said to her, Ask my mother, for I will not refuse you. I explained last time, they're humans, and he did end up refusing her because the request was very underhanded. Adonijah was tricking Bathsheba and trying to trick Solomon. But the basic idea stands, and God, who is omniscient and can never be tricked, and placing Christ, who is also deity, God, one God, but different persons, Father and Son, the fact that the Son sits at his right hand means God the Father will never refuse his Son. And he has the Father's ear at all times. And what we've seen so far is we are in Christ. Therefore, what confidence do we have? We always have the Father's ear and the Father's care. We are in close proximity to him because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the things I have to clarify and have clarified several times already is that Jesus Christ's enthronement today is not the millennial kingdom. The kingdom is not here. The kingdom is not operating. The kingdom is still future. Christ is enthroned on a different throne than the one he will take in Jerusalem when he returns and comes to earth. And we see that even in Psalm 110, verse 1, where it says, until, sit at my right hand, until, that's the time limit. That means sitting at his right hand, God the Father's right hand, and making his enemies a footstool for his feet do not happen at the same time. He sits at the right hand until that later thing happens. So Jesus Christ, as we see in Scripture, right now is God, at God the Father's right hand. That means his enemies have not yet been made a footstool for his feet. And what we see here that uh, I have to clarify that language because it sounds when he says in verse 22, he put all things in subjection under his feet. You would think, well, doesn't that mean that all things have been made a footstool for his feet? That's two different things. Psalm 110.1 indicates that to us. They don't happen at the same time. And we'll clarify that in a second. But there are two different thrones. There are two different time periods. Right now, he's at the right hand of the Father. And he waits for that time until he takes another throne. In Jerusalem, and that's what we see in Revelation 3, verse 21. It says, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, Christ's throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Christ is right now sit, seated on his Father's throne, at his Father's right hand. But he's waiting for that time when he takes his throne, and then all who have overcome in Christ will be seated at his side, by his throne. When does that time come? Matthew 25, verse 31 tells us. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. When? When the Son of Man comes in his glory. That's, what, uh, that's Matthew 25, but earlier in that discourse, the entire explanation was to the disciples asking Jesus, uh, when is your coming and what is, this, what is the sign of your coming and when is the end of the age? So when does this age end 
And when will you return? And so he answers that through all of those events of the tribulation. And then it says here, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Finally, at the end of that, Jesus Christ returns in glory. And then he will sit on his glorious throne. Um, Why is this important? Now, I'll maybe touch on this a little bit more later. Why is it important? Why do I even make this distinction and say that Jesus Christ being seated at the right hand is not the same thing as the millennial kingdom? Number one, it gives believers today, if we misunderstand this and we think the kingdom is operating today, we are thinking that there is no millennial kingdom. We think that today this is what God had promised to Israel long ago. Israel would have no place for the future. We would have no place in a real kingdom that overtakes the earth. But when we distinguish these and we put them in the proper place, we realize there is a wonderful future. There is a kingdom coming in which Jesus Christ will perfectly rule. And we won't have to turn on the news and hear terrible things anymore because Christ will be a righteous ruler. We do not want to take that away, that blessing, that hope that we have. That's a wonderful thing to look forward to. So we have to distinguish these. It also would mean that we would begin operating in ways that are unbiblical, trying to do things that God never designed the body of Christ to do. If Christ is seated on the throne of David in heaven, if there were such a thing, that's basically what these amillennialism and postmillennialism teach, that the kingdom's now, only it's a spiritual kingdom, it's not an earthly kingdom. Christ is ruling today, and we are in the kingdom. Therefore, what do we do? We keep the law, we operate uh, under the rod of iron that Christ is supposed to wield when he returns, it becomes a mess. We have to distinguish this and we have to realize Christ's seating today is not the same as when he takes the throne in Jerusalem in the future. Okay, that's how God has exalted Christ. He's given him a position. And it says it's above all, and it lists these four different terms, and it says every name that is named, referring primarily to angelic beings. He has been placed above, obviously, every earthly ruler, but even in his humanity, above all angels and demons in the entire spiritual realm. Jesus Christ is over all of it. And that's not just today, not just in this age, but also in the age to come. He is exalted no matter what time period it is. He is exalted in his humanity. Okay, and that brings us to the second and really the final point which is that God displayed his power in empowering Christ. In Christ's humanity, God the Father has given him the power to actually rule, to apply a leadership and a rule that one day will be a rod of iron overtaking the whole earth, nothing standing in his way. As a human being, obviously as Jesus Christ is God, he could exercise his omnipotence at any point. But this is talking about in his humanity. He is both God and man. And in his humanity, he is like us, or at least before a resurrected body, he was just like us, limited. Now, as the glorified Jesus Christ in his humanity, he will exercise a rule that will overtake the whole earth, that will be under him perfectly, and he will rule as no leader ever has before. So God has empowered him to do that. Um, To understand this, we see this in verse 22. Paul says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. So all things have been subjected to him. But even though that's true, here's here's one of the things, a caveat to it. All things are in subjection to him, but he is not exercising the subjugating part of that. This is a reference back to Psalm 8, which is a reference back to Genesis 1, 28. I know that gets complicated. The the scripture trail here, Genesis 1:28. God put mankind, all of humanity, in Adam and Eve to start, but all of humanity in a position of authority over all creation to subdue and rule the earth. Subdue and rule. They had the position. They even had the power to do it. There was just one thing that was left for them to do. Go out and do it. They actually had to take the creation and bring it in subjection to them. And that's what we read in Hebrews 2.8. It says, You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. Think about that. 
the writer of Hebrews is saying that to humanity, all things were put in subjection to them as a matter of fact, and nothing was left outside of that, at least in the earth. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. How could both things be true unless we understand that one is that they have the power to do it and the other is that they haven't actually gone out and done it yet? Christ has the power. Now, the issue isn't any deficiency in Christ not going out and subjugating the earth. It's actually a wonderful thing. He is patiently waiting. So he has the power to do it, but there's a right time. It's that time after he sits at the Father's right hand. When he returns and he takes his glorious throne, then he will bring all things in subjection under his feet. And we also saw the significance of that phrase, under his feet, when we looked at that situation with Joshua, leading um, this battle in Gibeon against those five kings who came against Gibeon. And he fights them back, and these five kings run to these caves uh, Joshua basically closes up the caves, goes and defeats the armies there, and then comes back and takes all of his military commanders, pulls these kings out, and has all of his military commanders put their feet on the throats of those kings. And that's purely symbolic. He's trying to demonstrate and tell the people of Israel something. We have conquered these kings. The highest people in authority in those various cities were put in subjection under the feet of the military commanders of Israel. We see that in Joshua 10, verse 24. So that's the background to this. We're going to look at, finally, the last part of verse 22 and verse 23 after we read from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 23. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth in him. In him also we have been obtained as an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and that he took human flesh to be related to us, to represent us, to take our place, to pay for sin once and for all, and to be victorious over it so that we can have eternal life by simply believing in him. Lord, we thank you for the sure hope that we have, that we have certainty about the future because Christ has accomplished everything and he guarantees it. The fact that he's already done it 
tells us that anything that he seeks to do in the future will be accomplished. Lord, we are grateful for that. We are hopeful and we want to set our sights on the future. But even right now, as we study this passage and understand its implications in our lives, we recognize there is work to be done. There are things that you've given us to do. There is a role for us to play, and it's a wonderful, very important role in your program that has much purpose and pleases you. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand that, help us to apply it to our lives, and to be active, to be people who who view ourselves as members of the body of Christ and rejoice over all that we have in him. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. As we jump back in, looking at uh, how Christ has been empowered by God, we see this phrase here. So he's been empowered over all things. That's the beginning of verse 22. But he's also been empowered over the church. God gave him as head over all things to the church. That word head right there means an authoritative position, that he is the one who gives the commands, gives the orders for the church. He's the one who decides. It is a a position of authority. And what's really important here to understand, because uh, when we first went over this, I talked about how there are all sorts of headships all throughout life. Uh, there are different levels of authority, and it is a basic, functional part of human society. Whether it's in the family, whether it's in a workplace, whatever it might be, there are always going to be positions of authority. And that is not a wrong thing. But each one has to be looked at according to its own merits. And you have to decide, okay, what level of authority is here? What provisions have been given? So in the household... A husband does have a headship over his wife, but that is not to be equated to the parents' headship over their children. There has to be a difference, a big difference between those two. An employer does not have the same headship over his employees that a father has over his children. So all of these things have to be looked at according to each specific headship that's given. Christ's headship, though, is very interesting in that it's exhaustive. Look, it says, head over all things. There's nothing that falls outside of Christ's headship for the church. Obviously, if the whole universe is under him, and he could, I mean, if he wanted to, but we understand God's plan. If he wanted to, he could bring anything in subjection to him at any point. It would not surprise us then that one realm of that, the church, is also totally under his headship. Everything is under Christ in the church. So our biggest concern is not our feelings, it's not the world around us, it's not the experiences we have. It's what does God's word say and what is Christ's role in my life and in the body of Christ. He gets to tell me how I should live, how I should operate, how the church, local churches and the body of Christ as a whole should function. We don't get to make it up. We don't get to be pragmatic about it. We don't get to go on what we feel and prefer. We go according to what Christ has set up for us. So Christ is the head. And importantly, with that, we are, as his church, the body. We see this in verse 23. So it says right here, he's been made head over all things to the church. And then it clarifies, what is the church, which is his body? Makes perfect sense. He's the head. He also has a body. So head and body are brought together as a whole being in some sense. At least that's the metaphor, the picture that's being painted there. So Christ is the head over this body. Why does Paul use this illustration? And not only here. This is used a number of times in his writings to describe the church. It's because it wonderfully pictures how so many different people, individuals, can be brought together and work as a system together, as an organism together, going toward the same goal, going toward the same mission. And even in our failures, even though some people uh, don't grow in Christ, they get saved and they don't grow, all of that is factored in. It still moves forward. It still is alive and well. The body of Christ is a living organism that is fulfilling God's purposes right here, right now in the world. So Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 actually describes this metaphor in more detail. So he just calls it the body here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 23. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 
The context is, now he's correcting the Corinthian church on a number of different issues all the way through the book on how a church should operate and what their concerns should be, what the way they live should be. And he gets to chapter 12, and apparently when it came to the Spirit's work in their local congregation, there were some abuses and some major misunderstandings. So the whole context is, how does the Spirit work in the body of Christ and in a local assembly? And he says this in verse 4, Now there are, are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. They had been abusing what we would call today uh, the miraculous gifts. And I believe, as the New Testament closed, those gifts no longer were being given. doesn't mean God doesn't perform miracles. It simply means those specific, special gifts that he was giving out in that period, he's not giving out anymore. So if God wants to perform a miracle, he will do so at any time he pleases. But he's not gifting people to go out and heal and to prophesy and to speak in tongues. Those things were for a specific time according to a specific purpose. But apparently those were the gifts, the flashy gifts, were the things that everyone was drawn to in the Corinthian church. And they wanted to be able to have these utterances and they wanted to be able to stand up and prophesy and they wanted to be able to lay hands on people and heal. And this whole point is not everybody gets the same gifts. So even if the gift of tongues was being given today, not every person would have that. Only a small percentage of people would have that. God has a different purpose for everything. He did not create a body, just like a human body. Is the body just an eye? If the body were just an eye, it wouldn't be alive. It doesn't have all of the systems and things attached to it for it to continue to operate and be healthy and to be alive. In the same way, the body of Christ is supposed to be diverse. By its very nature, it's supposed to have all these different things going on that are working together for the health of the whole and in uh praise or in honor of Jesus Christ, to honor him. So that's what he's describing. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. So you see diversity and unity in that. And so then he goes on to say in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 12, the spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills, for even as the body, there we go, now he's connecting these gifts that are being given out to this body picture. What relationship do gifts have to the body of Christ? He continues, For even as the body is one and works all things, I'm sorry, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. The body has many different parts to it. Those gifts, so we're the different parts. I'll put it this way. The people are the parts of the body. Each one of us is like a a cell in a human body, if we're going to compare it to something. And each one of us is empowered and given a role to play in the body. So we function together is the picture that he's painting there. And then he deals with the issue of, well, there are different body parts, and some are more esteemed than others. Some might think that they have no major role to play and might sort of see themselves as, really not important to the whole body. And others might esteem themselves very important and say, yeah, you're right. You aren't very important to the body. And both of those are mistakes. He says in verse 15, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. So the foot, even a foot or whatever it might be, remember this is a metaphor, whatever it might be, whatever person it might be and whatever role they might play, so long as it's biblical, has an important part to play in the body of Christ. In verse 21, he continues. So he goes through a number of these, and then he shows sort of the other side. So that's the foot saying, I'm not important. And then this is the other body part saying, yeah, you're not important. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Because the body can't function very well. The eye can do its job. And yet, if you don't have hands, any person that's ever had some uh, disability or whatever it might be, recognizes that these things matter a great deal. Whatever that disability might be, it's, we understand living in a fallen world, people can still have a wonderful life with having some disability. However, we do recognize that it is maybe the ideal, and it's what we're going to see in glory, is that people are whole. People have everything they need. 
So to not have a hand would be a big deal. That would be debilitating in some, in some way. So that's the picture he's painting. If you look back at Ephesians 1, he's painting a picture of a body that has many different parts all functioning together, all working together for God's glory. And how do they work? It's through gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. And here, uh, just for the sake of time, I'll just try to run through this really quickly because we're going to get to this passage later, but he develops this whole idea of the gifts and expands on this later in chapter 4 when he says, verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So right there, he's talking about gifts in chapter 4, talking about how the body of Christ works. Every single person has been given a gift, at least one gift. Some people maybe multiple gifts, but every person in the body of Christ has something that God has given them to do, and the ability to do it is basically the idea. Then he says this, therefore it says, this is Ephesians 4 verse 8, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, that should tell us something, ascension, very similar to verse uh, 20, let me see. Verse 20, yes, seated at his right hand. He ascended and was seated. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Why does the Apostle Paul, in a section where he's talking about spiritual gifts, refer to the ascension of Christ? Why does he refer to ascending to something? He's saying that Jesus Christ, when he was seated at God the Father's right hand, in his ascension, is a picture, or it's very similar, to a military procession in which a victor would ascend, or as David in military victory would ascend upon Mount Zion. When the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and ascended, it shows victory, and the person who is victorious gets spoils. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some of this, but we've talked about it before, and I've shown you some of these passages. In the Old Testament, under the law, that was a part of a military victory. God gave the Israelites the ability. uh, Actually, it was a command. It's not even the ability. He demanded that when they went into Canaan, they wiped out the people. But if it was people from another surrounding area that they were coming against, that they were allowed to take spoils from those people. They were to wipe out the Canaanites completely. But from those outside of that region, that land, they were allowed to take spoils from that. And they would distribute it among the military leaders. That's what's being pictured in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. When he's talking about the body, when he's talking about Christ as head over the church, when he's talking about him being seated, all of this fits together to show that when Christ was seated at God the Father's right hand, he was a military victor. He got the right to to then distribute according to the Spirit all of these gifts throughout the whole body of Christ. Why did Jesus say in John chapter 16, before his crucifixion, John chapter 16, verse 7, it is to your advantage that I leave. Because if I don't go, the helper can't come. Because Jesus Christ in his humanity had to become victorious, had to ascend to the throne at the Father's right hand. And then, once he has merited that, once he has achieved that, God the Father gives him the right, the spoils, to then distribute to the body of Christ all of these different gifts. And each one of us are the beneficiaries, because of our position in Christ, the beneficiaries of those gifts. That's what's going on in this passage, referring to him being seated, referring to him as being head over all things to the church, referring to him as, or the church being his body. All of that refers to these people having gifts, and functioning together. So this leaves just one final phrase. And the first time we went through this, I actually didn't get to this in much detail. And I won't be able to uh, get into much detail here. But luckily, these phrases, we will come across more in the book of Ephesians. They do come up elsewhere. But there's, uh, there's two basic phrases here. The fullness of him, and then, or the fullness, that's one, and then the one who fills all in all, but it's translated in New American Standards as of him who fills all in all. Okay, so there's the fullness, and then there's the one who fills all in all, is the basic idea here at the end of verse 23. To understand what fullness is, 
We could do a whole study of the way this word is used, and that would be very helpful. I'll just give you some highlights here. Psalm 24, verse 1, actually uses this when they translated from Hebrew to Greek. They use this word, fullness, in Psalm 24, verse 1. It says, the earth is the Lord's, and all it contains, and all its fullness, all that fills it. The, thing, the idea is the earth looked as if it were a container being filled up with things. All of it belongs to the Lord. What's in the earth? What's on the earth? Well, there's all sorts of land, water, sky. That all belongs to God. The different regions, the different topography. You have different nations and kingdoms, possessions, wealth, all of that. All people, all animals, everything that fits into this container called earth. All of it belongs to God. So it sets up this idea of a container. But as this word is used, it can talk about all sorts of things being containers. Time. The filling up of time is one aspect. We actually see that earlier in Ephesians 1, verse 10. It says, to the uh, uh, view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, the filling up of the times. I like to picture that as like an hourglass because it's a literal picture of this. Turn over that hourglass and the sand falls down until it fills it up. And you know what? A half an hour, I forget what it is. It's an hourglass. An hour has passed. So that's one picture of it. You can think about it also like putting a date on your calendar. Oh, you have a meeting or you have a vacation or whatever it is. And the time that it takes to fill up all those days until you get there. The container is time in that sense. You have promises that can be containers. Um, You have all sorts of things in Scripture that are being filled up until they reach their limit. And they are finally accomplished. And so we have to figure out what is the fullness? What is the thing that is being filled up? What's the container? And if you look at the grammar, um, in English it, it actually brings this out fairly well. But in Greek it would make this even more specific. You always look to the nearest antecedent. So when you're looking at a word, a noun specifically, and you're trying to define it, you want to look back in this situation to the noun that is closest to it, that agrees with it. So what's the noun that's closest to it? The fullness is closest to the body. And you know what they agree? They agree in both number and gender in Greek. Have to have both of those for them to, for fullness to be referring to body. And they do agree in that way. So this tells me absolutely for certain that the fullness refers to the body. So what is God's fullness? His fullness is the body. So the body is the container. It's the thing being filled that God is filling. And God is the one who fills it all in all. And it's probably more than I can get into because I'll just say this. Theologians have debated what is going on here, what's being talked about, what is all in all. Is it all people in all ways? That's normally how people would take it. Is it in its entirety so that just everything exhaustively Uh, As if it's just emphatic. It's all in all to the furthest degree. There's different ways it could be taken. I understand this as going back to this head and body metaphor, fullness and being filled. The same way that a head functions to a body is the way that God, as the one who fills, functions with the body being filled. What happens to a body, and I, I don't mean to be grotesque here, but what happens to a body if it is decapit- if it loses its head? What happens? It dies. Can't do anything. There's no power. There's no life there. Christ, being the head, is literally the life source, the thinking, the direction, everything. He is the control center of the entire church. And as we've already pictured, he controls and helps us function by giving us those gifts. These are just different metaphors that Paul... He does this often. He'll just stack metaphors, one metaphor after another, to try to help us understand so that there is no doubt in our minds. Jesus Christ is the power source. We can't get away from it. He's the one who gifts us. He's given us a purpose. We need to do something with that. But it all comes from Jesus Christ. He's the one who fills us. And that's why I'm not surprised to see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul, in that same discussion we looked at just before, He's talking about these gifts that Jesus Christ was given at his ascension that he's able to distribute. In Ephesians 4, verse 10, he says, or it says, He who descended is himself also he who ascended. That's Christ. He who ascended. There's the ascension again. 
far above all the heavens, so that. We always want to pay attention to words like that. So that. This is telling us a result or a purpose here. Why? Why did he ascend? So that he might fill all things. Jesus Christ fills. And you know what the discussion right after that is? The very next verse? He lists different spiritual gifts. He's given apostles and he's given prophets. And I believe both of those were for that first century of the uh, New Testament period. But then he goes on. Evangelists and pastors and teachers. He's given those for the equipping of the body so that we would be mature, that we would grow up to the stature of Christ. The whole picture is that God gives these gifts, Christ gives these gifts, so that we can grow and accomplish his purposes and fulfill what he's given us right here, right now. So to wrap this first chapter up, I want us to just look at as a whole picture one final time what is going on here. So God has blessed us. Verse 3, we've received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Here's the keys. In Christ, and I've talked about this extensively, no one who is out of Christ, that's everyone who's born into this world naturally and has not believed in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And it's very important that we clarify. The only way a person gets in Christ is by believing. It's not, you don't go through catechism, you don't get baptized, you don't do any. Thing, any possible work or achievement or thing that we could do will never put us in Christ. Believing in him alone and his work is what places us in Christ. Once we're in Christ, we have all of these blessings. He calls them spiritual. So we know that this is in the realm of the spirit. These are eternal, permanent spiritual blessings that we receive. And we receive these blessings through the Father's program. He's elected us to serve him. He wants us to serve him. He's predestined us as heirs, so at the end we receive a wonderful inheritance. Jesus Christ has done the work to make this all possible. He's the Redeemer. He went to the cross, and since he accomplished that and paid that ransom price, he revealed himself as our next of kin, the kinsman Redeemer, the one who will sum up everything as a human being, sum up everything in God's program. That's what's going on in verse 10. He's going to sum up all those things. And then we are, uh, because he's redeemed us, we are actually property of God. If he paid a price, well, he bought something back. And so we are God's property. And then we see that the Spirit has guaranteed all this by sealing us to preserve us and giving us or himself being the pledge that the promise will be fulfilled. Everything that is in the future, everything that's promised here is guaranteed because we have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Verse 15, then we respond to all of this. The Apostle Paul responded in his own way, but we respond by recognizing all of these truths, number one. That should motivate us. But then in prayer we can respond. We can pray and we can give thanks to the Lord. And then we can apply. That's the main part of the end of this. When Paul is asking that we would be given a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, that we would be able to apply all that we've seen here. If it stays on the pages of Scripture, can be true about you. It can even be true about you. You're in Christ. You have all these blessings. And if you read this and you don't do anything with it, you don't apply it to your life, you don't grow through it. This has to be taken. Take this off the page of Scripture and apply it to yourself. This actually has real-world application to us right here, right now. I have been called to serve God in his program. I am God's treasured property. Think about how that should shape the way I think and the way I live and the way I conduct my life. And God is so powerful that I have absolute confidence in his plan today as Christ is the head of the church and I'm merely one member of it, gifted to function in a role. I know that he will accomplish all things even in the next age that he will take the throne in Jerusalem, and I get to be there, I get to be a part of it as a believer in the body of Christ. That's what's being talked about here as you look at it from a whole. Take these truths and apply them to your lives. Ask yourself how this should function in your own life, and if you take seriously what Scripture says, how you should be functioning in the body of Christ as a whole, but also in a local assembly 
It's not a little thing to be a part of a local church. We might just look at it because of American culture as, you know, that's just something we do. It's just like one part of my week or a couple times a week. No, this is my identity. This is who I am. This is what I've been gifted to be a part of and be a part of it. Each one of us has a role to play. And we all benefit from the ministry and the help of each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you've accomplished in Christ, who he is, and the relationship we get to have with you through him. And Lord, we thank you that we are perfectly identified with him, that because of his death in our place to pay for our sins and his resurrection, guaranteeing us eternal life, that we have total confidence in your plans and that we get to uh, be a part of it with joy. We don't have to, as the rest of the world, uh, live in fear. We don't have to uh, wonder about what's going to happen. We know exactly where we're going. We know exactly what your plan is headed towards. And Lord, we are excited for the future, but we are also very serious about today. We want to live for you. We want to function as your stewards, as your people, um, doing the things that you've given us, specifically bringing the gospel into the world and discipling people, uh, sharing the truth of Scripture so that we can all grow uh, into mature believers in Christ. Lord, we thank you for all of this, and we pray this in your name. Amen.